David the Chameleon burst out into the big wide world. When Labour was first trying to deal with the fresh young challenge from David Cameron, they came up with this, Dave the Chameleon, the ultimate non-conviction politician who let the backdrop define him. From now on, he would only tell people whatever he thought they wanted to hear, whether he and the Blue Party liked it or not. No better example of this chameleon-like tendency, say Mr Cameron's critics, than his attitude over the years to Europe. Say whatever's necessary or expedient to get out of a difficult news cycle or party rebellion and then count on your ability as a brilliant salesman to get you out of difficulty before disaster strikes. They voted for David Cameron, 134,400... David Cameron secured the Conservative Party leadership in 2005 partly by appealing to the Eurosceptic right of his party, a promise to take the Conservatives out of the European People's Party grouping in the European Parliament was essentially meaningless to most voters, but acted like catnip to a certain type of Conservative MP. Actually, the caricature that he uh, made these noises to try to sort of win around the right of the party really isn't true, because I discussed these issues with him in private company as well as seeing what he was saying public, and there was no disconnect. Uh, he genuinely uh, believed that uh, the European Union needed fundamental reform was committed to trying to do that. Uh, that's why he took the tough decision to leave the EPP with all the criticism that uh, gave. It's why he vetoed uh, the, the treaty um, uh, when he became prime minister with all of the flack that he got on that. Um, but in the end, it just wasn't possible to get the kind of uh, reform that could unite the party. But the byproduct of those decisions was to cut David Cameron off from like-minded centre-right EU leaders like Angela Merkel and Nicolas Sarkozy and it made it impossible for him to block the rise of Jean-Claude Juncker. The Eurosceptics wanted more and more, but David Cameron, having raised expectations during his leadership contest, told them to keep quiet. Instead of talking about the things that most people care about, we talked about what we cared about most. While parents worried about childcare, getting the kids to school, the balance between work and family life, we were sometimes banging on about Europe. I think when you're a leader of a Conservative Party that has such a clear uh, part which is dedicated to being Eurosceptic and, and, and really um, very difficult to, I guess, to get a decision that would have satisfied everybody, I think what, what always impressed me about David as Prime Minister was that he did try and uh, deliver for that group as well as deliver for the rest of the country. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure that when it came down to it at the 2005-2010 general elections that Europe was the top agenda item for voters at the ballot box. Like a brilliant but mercurial batsman, David Cameron tried to knock the ball out of the park to win the match on Europe, when perhaps a more cautious politician would have blocked and parried. But his approach worked until it didn't. He was convinced he could win fundamental reform of the EU. He promised his party and the country. I will go to Brussels. I will not take no for an answer. And when it comes to free movement, I will get what Britain needs. This promise and the referendum pledge itself were designed to neutralise the increasing threat that Mr Cameron saw from UKIP. Do you accept or not that in your renegotiation, free movement is not up for discussion? I don't accept that. Nigel is basically really? saying, give up before you've begun. In that election, the UKIP threat was contained. But at what cost? The unexpected victory gave Mr Cameron a huge problem. He didn't have to offer the referendum, but the reality was, once he gave that promise, he had to deliver on it. There is no way that the uh, Conservative Party at Westminster would allow that promise not to be delivered. Funnily enough, I suppose one could say his biggest error was winning the 2015 general election, because had it still been a coalition, then of course the referendum, I suspect, would never have been allowed by the Liberal Democrats. Thank you very much. What happened next in the negotiations and the referendum has, of course, been well documented. David Cameron was unable to deliver, unable to satisfy large sections of his party, unable to persuade the British people. I think the truth is um, leaving the European Union is not the legacy David Cameron wanted. I can remember when I worked for him as an advisor uh, and we were discussing his approach on the Lisbon Treaty. Um, he once joked that uh, if we left the EU, at least he wouldn't have to worry about his legacy, as uh, Tony Blair uh, worried about his legacy in those days. 
On his last full day as Prime Minister, Mr Cameron tried to point us towards an alternative legacy, visiting one of the more than 300 free schools that have opened since he entered Downing Street. He looked relaxed, happy even, as if savouring the moment until it was time to say goodbye.